wonderful to invite um, Kelsey Inouye and David Mills um, to speak about uh, their work on publishing practices and discourses um, around predatory publishing. I think they're going to speak for about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, and then afterwards, um, hopefully we can facilitate some kind of discussion um, with questions and answers. Um, if you, if any questions or comments pop into your mind as they speak, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, and then when they finish their presentation, I will um, wrap up all of the, the questions and, and hopefully kind of facilitate a bit of the chat. Um, but yeah, so David, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Natasha. And again, apologies to everybody um, for really um, what's a very last minute move to a whole new seminar room across the across the, uh, the quadrangle, across the block. Um, it's, it's not often one's gazumped by Mahmoud Mamdani, so perhaps um, we should be um, um, not too not too upset. So I'm going to share my screen um, just so that everyone can see um, the, the slides. Can I just check that everyone can see that? OK, so um, this is um, our first chance to um, report on on a project that we began last year. Um, I had a great team of researchers, um, both in Oxford and at the University of Ghana, um, including Kelsey, who's going to present this um, presentation with me today. Now, it's, it, this is a controversial topic, um, an emotive one. Um, so I'm hoping we can use this discussion um, to sort of reflect on our own attitudes and perceptions of this of this phenomenon. Um, and um, we're going to present two um, the results and the findings from two papers that we've we've recently published. So so I'm going to start with an example of what we've been looking at and and why this research matters. And this is a headline from um, a, a research professional, which is an online um, media. Um, higher education media um, journalism outfit and there's lots going on in this image as you can imagine um, one could look at the imagery the, the the sort of the metaphors being used the connotations the representations of African research now our, our focus today isn't on um, research and education primarily or um, on Nigeria particularly but um, the bigger project has been looking very much at African public teaching practices um, so I'm going to tell you um, in, in two minutes what we're going to tell you today. Um, our summary um, is basically that this concept, um, which we're going to define as, or which gets defined as deceptive journals exploiting vulnerable researchers, is, is un inadequate and unhelpful for understanding what's really quite a complicated set of um, institutional forces. And we're going to describe um, the two papers we've published. One is a systematic review, um, and one is a discourse analysis. And um, Kelsey will go into the details of each of those two. And our argument here is that um, this discourse um, does, imp does impact the education field, does impact social sciences, even if it's coming from the science journals and often the elite science journals. And it shapes attitudes um, to research and to journals being published often on the margins of, um, of a global research economy. Um, which of course brings us, but will bring us back to the Nigerian case at the end, which we'll return to. So I'll go on. Um, those are the two papers. Um, we'll share these slides um, with everyone, so you can you can follow those up later at some point. Um, let me say a little bit about the concept, the label, the the sort of the. the, the yes, I'm gonna. Yeah. Come here. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Monica. Sorry, it's fine. It's fine. Sorry, just a reminder to um, be on mute. If, uh, while the presentation is happening. Thanks. So I'm, I'm not going to go back and talk about the sort of the long history of debates around um, academic integrity, um, but 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 I would highlight that this is this didn't begin in 2010, but certainly in 2010, a librarian in, in America um, started blogging quite um, regularly and quite um, um, to quite a lot, to increasing amount of, of sort of attention about and um, publishers that he um, called um, predatory, and um, he published a, an op-ed in the in the journal Nature in 2012 that then got an awful lot of attention. And if you look at how he was using this term um, predatory, um, it's 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 an interesting definition. It's quite a, a sort of diffuse, vague one. It's also quite a um, contentious one. So he uses words um, in his definition um, like fly by night business models. 
but basically he, he was particularly attentive to and worried about um, the commercial um, pressures that might lead open access publishers to um, to seek to sort of get more submissions in either through solicitation um, or not through doing full reviews. And he picked on um, journals, particularly in Nigeria and Pakistan, his first list. The list went on to, um, by the time of 2017, there was almost 1,100 publishers on the list. Um, and I, and our, our concern about this category of predatory publishing is that um, it's very imprecise, it's very political. And if you look at um, recent research that's tried to sort of um, unpack the definition and how it's used, one increasingly finds that it doesn't it doesn't hold that there are journals that might, by some criteria, be marked as predatory, whatever that was. But they are also um, they are also found in in lists of legitimate journals as well. So, so th there's a sense that this is a, um, a an almost impossible to, to define concept. Um, and um, the part of the problem, I think, is is with the way in which um, it starts by creating a, a very strong emotional reaction. We, we you know, all of us can't help but think, "Gosh, you know how awful." Um, and um, and 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 then and then that shapes how we think about the the, the, the term and how it's being used. Um, so, so we will try and show. Um, why why a lot of research in this field hasn't been done very effectively, hasn't actually listened to or talked to researchers, we'll look at the way in which this discourse gets promoted by the science journals, and then finally we'll look at its impact. Um, so you know, one reaction, of course, is, well, you know, you've all um, have probably been spammed by people asking you to send um, articles to in for publications or for conferences. And I think um, our concern here is um, less about um, less about whether you get email spams or not, but 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 more about the ways in which all of them are sort of lumped together as um, a sort of un, un, un sort of unproblematic category of predatory publishing, and 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 as a result, us not thinking about the the, the drivers and the, um, the the logics by which. Um, the global science system is being changed and um, expanding, and the, the pressures on all researchers to publish more, and the, the, the sort of the commercial commercial agendas. So, so our, our point here then is for Kay to say, right, yes, you the, the, go beyond your initial reaction and begin to think, um, as Kirsten Bell puts it, to think about well, what do we know more broadly about about what counts as legitimacy, as what counts as um, as credible scholarly journals. So, it's turning turning the lens back. Uh, at this point, I'm going to um, ask um, Kelsey to come in and um, talk about the first stage of what we did, which was our, our review of the literature. Great. So um, to build off of the context that David just explained, um, we began by doing a systematic literature review of the empirical studies on predatory publishing. And this literature review was guided by the research question, what is the existing research evidence on academic authors, motivations for and experiences of publishing in so-called predatory journals? So we wanted to see what the empirical studies were on the phenomenon um, in order to get perspectives of um, researchers who had actually participated in submitting and publishing in predatory journals. Um, this literature search was carried out across three databases, Scopus, Web of Science, and ProQuest, um, using a variety of keywords related to predatory publishing. Um, after filtering through the list for relevant titles, we ended up with 686 results related to predatory publishing. Um, after, through a series of subsequent filtering um, filtering tasks, we then uh, ended up with only 18 papers um, based on abstracts that were related to our research question. And finally, after reading the full texts of these papers, we ended up with a total of, um, well, 16 after we also included an additional article that we found while doing um, background reading. So there were only 16 papers in our sample that looked at um, empirical research on authors' motivations. Okay, uh, next there. So first, um, I'll describe a bit of the general results from the analysis of um, the papers that we included in our sample. 
So first of all, of the 16 papers, um, only five of those papers included actual interviews with researchers. The majority relied on large surveys, asking questions related to um, awareness of predatory publishing and that sort of thing, publishing practices. Um, looking at the disciplines of journals that these papers were published in, um, the majority appeared in librarianship and publishing related journals, um, followed by social science journals, with a few in medicine and research policy. Finally, I just want to note that we did not focus specifically on assessing methodologies um, when filtering out these papers, as there were quite a wide range of um, methods and uh, different sorts of interview um, schedules and surveys used. And so we found it um, unhelpful to really sort of compare on that level when filtering down our sample. OK, so some key findings from our analysis of these 16 uh, empirical papers. So first, um, motivations behind publishing are key. So motivations to publish in so-called predatory journals were shaped by institutional and national contexts. So the studies highlighted the importance of considering institutional contexts in discussions, such as, um, for instance, there was a paper that looked at Iran's requirement that graduate students publish their work in order to graduate. So that was a major institutional factor that put pressure on um, early career researchers. While another paper described how universities in Ghana make publications a requirement for promotion. So even though such policies are meant to increase research capacity, um, publishing in open access journals with low APCs which are um, our article processing charges, offered a simple way of improving CVs and advancing careers. Further, many articles discussed particular challenges that researchers faced in emerging universities in countries that are on the margins of global science. But it's important to point out that even though a lot of the focus on predatory publishing is in you know, particular countries, um, some of the empirical research we found pointed out that predatory publishing is not just an issue in the global south. So, for instance, a study in Denmark also showed that early career researchers experience similar pressures to publish that influence publishing decisions in um, countries such as India and China. Knowledge of academic publishing practices. So several survey based studies suggested that most researchers lacked knowledge of predatory publishing, primarily in the um, global south. However, other studies suggested that researchers such as those in Ghana are aware of predatory publishers, but experience frustration with the academic publishing culture. Um, so, for instance, they felt that sort of the long time it took to publish um, the very stringent sort of peer review, um, that sort of thing, were quite frustrating and could be a motivation to choose um, other non-mainstream journals. Um, finally, other researchers in Global South countries believed that they had less training and fewer resources, as well as lacking English skills, um, while others also believe that the research that they conducted wouldn't appeal to some of these sort of mainstream Western journals. And so these were other more contextual factors related to motivations um, in choosing to publish in um, so-called predatory journals. Editors. Um, only two of the papers we looked at actually sought the views of editors of predatory journals. Um, one suggested that 40% of interviewed editors were not aware that their journal was viewed as questionable, while another study um, found that um, the surveyed uh, editors of journals and reviewers of these so-called predatory journals um, had very limited engagement. So this suggests that um, the people who are involved in editing these journals um, don't have a lot of knowledge about um, sort of the publishing practices that are occurring. And finally, conceptualizing predatory publishing. So 12 of our 16 papers still used Beale's list in order to inform their um, research approaches. So for instance, they drew on Beale's list to identify predatory journals and then contacted authors of the papers who appeared in um, journals on Beale's list. 
So um, Beale still plays a very big role in um, the concept of predatory publishing and what makes a journal predatory. Three papers, however, use the term predator, but do not use Beale's list in their research designs, and one did not use predator at all, but instead used the term um, non-mainstream publishers as a way to characterize what the vast majority of the literature um, refers to as predatory. So of this, oh, Sorry, one more point. Um, so of the 16 papers, um, three also offered a more critical conceptualization of alternative publishing cultures. Um, so that one by Chavarro et al. 2017, which to use the non-mainstream term, talked about how um, these non-mainstream publishers provide opportunities for Colombian PhDs to practice publishing their work and let local researchers disseminate their work through open access. So it, it provides an alternative perspective on the role these journals can play within the community. Next. So building off our findings from this first study, we then decided to do a discourse analysis of um, journal editorials, specifically those in scientific and medical journals. And the reason for this is because we found we were uncomfortable with a lot of the language used um, to talk about the nature of predatory publishing. So drawing on the results from our initial systematic review, the 686 um, papers that were returned, we then um, took out the editorials from there, which ended up being about 229 science journal editorials once we filtered for duplicates and that sort of thing. Um, based on this, we then conducted a discourse analysis focusing on affective, emotive language um, associated with predatory publishing. So um, as you can see here, there are just a few examples. Um, through multiple iterations of reading and discussing between with me and David, we came up with these three major categories of affective language, um, fear, fakery, and exploitation. Okay, so to begin with, um, I'm just going to paint the larger landscape of these scientific journal editorials. Um, primarily, these editorials were published in medical journals, um, followed by journals in science and engineering, nursing and dentistry, with, I believe, four or five editorials in pharmacy journals. In terms of geography, um, these journals are published primarily in Northern Europe, North America, and South Asia, specifically uh, India and Pakistan, contributed a number of journals. Um, over 50% of the editorials also referred explicitly to Beale, again showing his influence in shaping the discourse around this topic. And finally, although we did not set any time limits on the search, none of the results were published before 2012, which is, of course, around the time when Beale um, began to uh, publish about pub predatory publishing. So a few key findings, 84% of the, um, well, editorials, not articles, um, deployed one or more of either the fear, fakery, or exploitation discourses. So for fear, common language included things like threat, warn and trap, risk, menace. Underlying the discourse was the argument that predatory publishing pollutes or damages the integrity of science and in medical sciences specifically, there was the threat of um, material harm to patients based on um, inaccurate results. In terms of fakery, common language included words like bogus, scam, and counterfeit, particularly in relation to peer review and impact factors. Sting operations were cited repeatedly as evidence of fakery by predatory publishers. And exploitation. Common terms included prey, victims, lure, seduce. And here, metaphors related to entrapment were particularly common. So things like researchers falling prey to predatory publishers. In terms of co-occurrence of discourses, 61 editorials combined all three types of discourse, and co-occurrence of various discourses was quite common. Um, fear and expectation, Exploitation were often paired together as metaphors. 
Um, for instance, this is a quote from an editorial by Tandon, Kanchan, and Christian. Um, predatory journals are a coterie of vultures who prey on the researchers, and the ignorant researchers, like a flock of sheep, happily walking into their trap to be preyed upon. So very sort of um, vivid emotive language there. Um, and finally, I would like to just draw some attention to the very few uh, dissenting voices that we came across in these editorials. So of the 229, there were only nine uh, editorials that tried to offer alternative perspectives on predatory publishing and seek to sort of broaden the argument. Uh, generally, these editorials noted that quality issues around transparency and financial gain are also found in legitimate publications um, and st structural influences often play a role in predatory publishing, suggesting that it is the academic pub publishing culture itself that may give rise to many problems. These findings are consistent with our results from the systematic review um, in that they show that alternative perspectives are still very lacking. Um, a lot of the factors are um, related to um, context as well. And these editorials in which there were dissenting voices appeared primarily in social science journals, as well as journals published in the global south, rather than the sort of more elite um, science and medical journals, which may say something about um, the amplification of the discourse and who is uh, questioning the predatory publishing conversation. Shall I take over now, Kelsey? So this is just a highlight, as Kelsey pointed out, that um, a few a few journals um, disproportionately published an awful lot of editorials about predatory publishing, and um, and Nature um, was one of the first to publish this um, um, editorial by Jeffrey Beale in 2012, and since then, I think it's fair to say, Kelsey, isn't it? It had published more editorials on this concept than any other journal. And here we have just even last year's um, correspondence. So by editorial, we're also including um, some news items as well. Um, and, and so this is very interesting um, in, in as much as this is obviously an elite journal um, that it charges you know, incredibly high um, article processing charges, something around $10,000 for an article. Um, and, and 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 its influence is ensures that um, these debates and the ways they're framed um, get taken up um, in many other journals in, in in the specialties of science and medicine, and then of course um, across other regions of the world. Um, it, it's worth highlighting that Nature um, has some very good um, um, <laughs> visuals, and 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 we didn't analyze these. Um, directly, but we, we highlighted these in our article that, of course, these are very powerful images, um, carnivorous, carnivorous journals, eating researchers, um, the researchers with their bags of money, um, um, lost in lost in this jungle of carnivorous plants. And then, of course, there's the wolf under the under the sheep's um, journal clothing. And, you know, and the, both of these were in editorials, um, ma major editorials um, published in Nature about attempts at defining and they, they, you know, there are several repeated attempts at trying to get the definition right of what, what does predatory publishing mean. Um, and of course, um, and the most recent paper among papers in, um, in Nature highlights this, the, the difficulty of, of keeping keeping these two categories of the good and the bad separate and increasing number of Scopus journals found to, found to be questionable. So, so, so the imagery is also very important. Um, in the last part of this talk, I just wanted to sort of try and bring it back to education. Um, I hope we've shown you um, the importance of trying to approach this this topic calmly and and systematically. That that's sort of where, where we began because, of course, it is so political and so politicised. We were aware in in writing and analysing the situation that the important thing here was not to sort of to weigh in with our, our views, but actually just to make sense of the situation in terms of the literature, which is why we did both a review of existing research and um, the, the discourse analysis. But I just wanted to return you to this um, this paper in the search media um, and um, the ways in which um, this then plays out for researchers in Africa. So 
Um, this paper was published in Comparative Education Review by um, an important research um, team in, in Cambridge, which were looking at the quality of um, and, and trying to promote the visibility of African research and education. Um, that they um, found that they were reported in a very particular way with this headline, predatory journals take a bite out of Nigerian education research. Well, why was this? Well, the story behind the headline was the paper um, tried to look at um, a database of, of educational articles that assembled. Um, this is um, the, the real, real research team. It's called the African Educational Research Database, um, led by Pauline Rose. And so they assembled a database of publications but um, decided to define reputable um, um, through the use of the Scopus impact factor. And um, this was their way of ensuring that um, of, the, of their, their large database of peer-reviewed publications, they were able to focus on ones that, 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 that actually were seen as having impact. As a consequence of using that as a definition, of course, some um, you know, a rather large number of African publications were, were left out, um, either because they were um, seen as, as not having a sufficient impact factor or, um, or because they weren't probably fully reviewed. But, it, but of course, the, the media story just gets reported as one third of, of journal articles are, are um, um, published in predatory journals, which is a sort of a, a very strong reading and a sort of misreading really of what we're trying to, what's really going on, which is that many of these scholars either wouldn't be able to afford the um, article processing charges for some of these journals, um, or um, were publishing in national, regional, national or regional um, journals that that weren't listed in Scopus because they too couldn't afford the the cost of getting registered within Scopus. So there's quite a lot of complexity of the the, the economy of publishing going on here that this headline really just um, just effaces. So I've sort of tried to explain that a bit here. If you think about the size of Scopus, there are um, you know there's 22,000 journals in Scopus but there are um, only 20 published in Nigeria. Um, and you know, that's, that, that's really quite shocking. Um, there, are, there are more journals, of course, there are many more journals than that um, across Africa in education and on something called the African Journals Online platform. Um, but those journals are, are from the purposes of, of Scopus and the purposes of um, sort of a global research community more or less invisible. So then the question comes of well, what sort of credibility should these national journals have? And is one consequence of, um, of an increasing attention to Scopus and an increasing worry about um, the, those guidelines around what gets in and what gets out is that many of these journals then get labelled as predatory. Um, and so they get excluded from the conversation or they, they, they find themselves undermined. So you know, our research, which has been working with Ghana and um, researchers has found that actually um, local, long, long lasting, long running scholarly journals increasingly find themselves um, not being able to attract um, quality submissions or enough submissions because academics are so focused on um, publishing in, in Scopus journals because that's what's required for, for promotion. So uh, just to conclude, um, we've tried to argue that the discourse around predatory publishing is, um, in our view, from our discourse analysis, certainly being promoted by um, um, what you might call the elite science journals um, and amplified um, within the higher education media and by publishers themselves and such that El Sevier will regularly run, run workshops um, in many universities on how to, you know, how to avoid publishing in the, in the wrong journals and you know and here's a list of useful journals you can publish in which might be the scopus ones so so the, the second point we want to make is that there's not enough research on these material conditions on the political economy of publishing and 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 lastly then the, the, the you need to think about the political economy along with the discourse and how we think about predatory publishing and how um how we understand it is is also reshaping um regional knowledge ecosystems across Africa. Um, so there's various things forthcoming um, and um, all I want to do is, is highlight the, the team. Um, it's been great working with um, um, Abigail and Kelsey and Natasha and Ioni in the department and my co-PI Patricia Kingori at um, Ethox and Paulina Twindana in the University of Ghana.